This is Nasha Kasha, Ukrainian Almanac, 28 minutes of stories for everyone about Ukrainian life. I'm your reporter, Stefan Andrusak, and this is episode 258. I recorded the first part of today's story in 2018. By the end of the program, today, in 2021, I will bring you an update. There are jobs, there are careers, there are vocations, and there are callings. This week we ask, what does one do when a religious calling presents itself? I'm in London, Ontario, in the Cherry Hill neighborhood. It's close to Western University with accessible housing. The neighborhood has a high proportion of seniors and students. There are 12 buildings, uniform in architecture, well-maintained grounds, a shopping mall, library, and good city bus connections. Michael and Alessandra Hayes welcome me into their eighth-floor apartment. So the coffee is stored in here. You grind it in there. You stick it in here. But first... I'm handed a cafe americano from a sophisticated espresso machine the size of a bread box. Coffee sipped and enjoyed. Our conversation begins. Hi, my name is Alessandra Hayes. And I'm Michael Hayes. So I was born in Edmonton. I have two younger siblings. My parents and siblings and I actually moved to the Middle East and I spent seven years there while I was growing up before I came back to Canada for university and stuff. Why the Middle East? Oh, well, my dad's a pilot, so he flies for Qatar Airways. Well, I was born in Etobicoke. I grew up in Mississauga. So my whole life up until my early 20s was in Mississauga. Went to the University of Toronto and then I moved to Ottawa for theology studies. What did your community Community life, your, your you and your friends look like when you were young. I spent 11 years playing hockey in the winter, and then in the summer I played various other sports: uh, soccer, baseball, lacrosse, and eventually ice hockey for the summer as well. Which position? Defense. What makes you a good defenseman? I never was the fastest skater, but I I knew the game and I could see the whole the whole surface and and read what, read what was happening and and make good decisions, which is what made me a better defenseman. As a forward, I had to be a lot faster, and that just wasn't who I was. So growing up, I went to an international school, so my friends were kind of from all over the place. Um, where I grew up, there wasn't a whole lot to do. Uh, just because of the weather and, and stuff other than so I, like I played sports in school and I've always been parts of part of choirs I've loved to sing since I was well I guess probably since I could talk languages spoken at home only English uh, I did learn a little bit of Arabic while I was overseas though mm-hmm. and uh, some French in school my mom grew up in South America so living somewhere other than home was sort of also part of her upbringing and she actually speaks four languages. My grandpa was Czech but she never actually learned Czech either but she speaks Spanish, Portuguese, French and English. Mm-hmm. And Ukrainian is that a part of your linguistic base at, a, at an early age? Not in the least. Talk to me about each of your paths, the realization of who you were and what you wanted to become? I guess my sort of major goal was to uh, work in something related to healthcare, uh, particularly helping the people who, who need it the most. Um, I have a, an interest in, in global health and things like doctors at borders or people who go the extra mile to help the people that don't have access to that help otherwise. For a lot of my time in elementary school and high school, I was very interested in things like biology and in particular marine biology. A major influencer in that was the crocodile hunter Steve Irwin. I used to watch his show all the time on Discovery Channel growing up. seeing him wrangle with different animals from the most dangerous snakes and 15 foot long crocodiles to the tiniest spiders that will kill a man 10 times over before he can blink. But then a teacher in grade 11 really changed things in a a law class I took. And that really shifted my focus from science to not necessarily law, but more humanities-based things. And then in grade 12, I had a a real conversion to the Catholic faith. I had grown up in a non-practicing but nominally Catholic family. I was baptized, went through Catholic school all the way, and but never really practiced it to any serious degree. But that changed when I was in grade 12. What what changed? What changed? I guess I, I experienced Christ for the first time in a real way. Oh. I tried, you know, in my sort of very scientific and logical mind, gave myself every reason not to, but I still had to. 
Christ made himself known to me, and I had to respond to that in a positive way. And from very, very early on in that process, I began to sense that priesthood would be in my future. Did you have a deep faith growing up? Growing up, I've I've always gone to church every Sunday, and I've been in a church choir since I was old enough to join the choir, so I did always want to go to church. But I don't think I really understood what it meant to be Catholic, and especially that that was more than just showing up at church on Sundays until I was in university. Encountering the the Catholic Student Association at, at McMaster, where I was studying, and having Catholic friends for the first time. How did the two of you meet? I was in my second year, second to last year of seminary. I was studying, I was doing some Greek homework in the cafeteria at St. Paul University in Ottawa, where I was studying. And a mutual professor of ours, uh, Brian Butcher, he was showing her around and introduced her to me in the cafeteria. So at McMaster, I was studying health sciences, and I wasn't really sure what I wanted to do, but I was thinking maybe med school, something like that. But when I applied, I didn't get in at least the, the first try, and so I was trying to figure out what to do next. And a friend of mine, a, a classmate at Mac, had done this one-year Christian liberal arts program at Augustine College in Ottawa that he spoke very highly of, and I was very impressed by the way he carried himself and his wide range of, of knowledge on a lot of topics from church history to art history. And, and so I applied, and I only planned to actually go for one term at first, but they convinced me to stay, which was lucky because I met Michael in the second term. What was that meeting like? Well, honestly, I was getting a tour, as he said, from uh, from Dr. Butcher, because I had done Taekwondo with him. He also, in addition to teaching at two colleges, teaches Taekwondo, and I had done Taekwondo previously, and so I was very excited to, to join him for that. And I believe he said, and this is Michael Hayes, he's one of our seminarians. Now, Michael, not looking at all Ukrainian, I assumed he was a Roman Catholic seminarian and kind of thought, oh, well, that's nice, moving on. (laughs) Because obviously Roman Catholic seminarians can't get married, so not a lot of prospects there. But as it turned out, he was actually a Ukrainian Catholic seminarian, and I kept running into him at Vespers and things like that, and we got to know each other a little better. He, he, was, uh, he was a little bit stressed out by his Greek homework and didn't, didn't really uh, have any interest in conversation at that point, so that was a very short conversation. Well, I was already on the brink of quitting the Greek. It was, it was totally uh, an optional thing for me, and I did it out of interest, and I, I, the next week or two weeks after I did, drop the Greek course. I was actually almost going to get it repaired because the sound was breaking and the pages were falling out. So, so is this the book that you were reading when you met her? This was the book that, yeah, working on the, the homework out of the, the, the questions out of here. So it's on your shelf. There's still hope. Well, I still hope to go back to it. If I ever do more academic studies, I'll need to know Greek. mentioned that in my last year of high school, I uh, came to the Catholic faith in a real way. And before too long, I I started learning about these other, well, there's these other Catholic, other parts of the Catholic world. And one of them, one one of them being the Ukrainian Catholic Church. I visited one of the, one of the parishes, the one in Brampton, St. Elias. That was nice. I didn't go back for a while. And then I went back on the Sunday after Christmas, and then I went back for Holy Week and Pascha, and that blew me away. And I started going more and more and more, and then I went to Ukraine for three months on a placement. I lived in Lviv for three months, and after that, there was no going back. After living in the heart of the Ukrainian Catholic world, there was no going back. I was, at, from, that, from that point, functionally Ukrainian Catholic. Did he tell you this early on in the meetings? Once I found out that he was a Ukrainian Catholic seminarian, and through him and some other Ukrainian Catholic friends in Ottawa, I sort of learned more about the church and what that meant. A friend of ours got married in Ukraine, so I had the opportunity to meet Michael there for a couple days, and he showed me all around Lviv. You haven't told me what it was that really brought you to Christ? Is it too private to ask? I mean, there there must have been some impactful moment. The major thing that happened was that my, my remaining doubt about the faith was in the real presence of Christ in the Eucharist. And 
at that retreat, that doubt was demolished. It, it was just a feeling that overcame you. It's wh- when I received the Eucharist at that uh, retreat, the overwhelming feeling, voice in the heart, perhaps is, is what I like to say, is that I am here, is what Jesus was saying when I received the Eucharist. Do I know that one? Yes, you do. I can try. Apologies if my Ukrainian is not good. And, and do you do you feel that kind of certainty about? The Ukrainian Catholic right, and I'm not talking about so much the the religious experience as the environment in which you're going to be expected to do your work and your healing. And well, now being involved, being very, very intimately involved with the Ukrainian Catholic Church for nine years now. Uh, my trip, that first trip to Lviv, was nine years ago, and just since then I've been living in it and I've experienced it in all sorts of different ways in different parts of the country in the United States, in Ukraine and I've just come to accept that this is who I am, this is what I'm a part of and I'm glad to be here and there are problems here like there are everywhere else everywhere else but there are so many blessings to be found here too and I want to be a part of this is this at all daunting to you? The prospect of being married to a priest is, is a little bit daunting as a Roman Catholic. Diving in head first into at least the English-speaking side of the Ukrainian Catholic world has been a little bit overwhelming, but also a lot of fun. I've met a lot of great people. Where do you see the nursing part of your future experience taking you? Is there still this longing to help less developed countries? So the interesting thing with the desire to help people in less developed countries is that I also realized that in Canada we have people that don't have access to health care. And so that also sort of gave me an interest in rural health. I think that really puts me in a good place to be able to serve people wherever it is that Michael gets sent, whether that's in a city or in a rural area or way up in northern Ontario. Like, who knows where our uh, where our life and our ministry will take us, but I kind of look forward to the adventure of being able to put my nursing skills to use wherever we are. This is not an easy time for the Roman Catholic Church, the Catholic Church as as a whole, certainly. Does that give you pause at all, or, or you, can you just talk about that? It's it's a tough time, and we're surely going to find out more as more secular jurisdictions are looking into this into more detail. What I like to focus on more is that I think this is a great time of hope. Because amidst all the bad stuff that's happened, this is a time of a purification. No longer can priests, bishops, and anyone else, no longer can anyone really hide this stuff because they know they're going to be found out. And so I hope that this purifies the ranks of the, the, the clergy and we can almost start afresh where only the people who are most serious about the vocation and to serve, not their own desires, whatever those might be, but to serve Christ's people and the whole world with honesty, with integrity, and be holy. So my hope is that this will happen. There may be some people in our communities where you will be posted that will be looking for leadership from the Dobrodika, from the wife of the priest in the community in a Ukrainian way. Does, have you thought about that at all? Because that, that'll certainly be a challenge. Yeah, I think that'll definitely be a challenge, especially because at least currently I don't speak any Ukrainian. I can read it to the extent of singing it in church and I can say some church words, but I mean, things like Lord have mercy are not necessarily super useful in everyday conversation, but I am definitely, um, 
open to, to learning more about both the language and the culture and stuff. And I mean, I love Ukrainian food. I, I grew up in Edmonton. I'm just going to need a lot of help along the way. What level of Taekwondo did you complete? Well, I will hopefully be testing for my third Dan Black Belt in a couple weeks. So all you Ukrainians out there who may encounter Dobrodika, Alessandra in the future, <laughs> thank you so much. you will burn these bridges and who will build them back up again the song by Christina Solovy earlier you heard a snippet from the theme for the TV show Steve Irwin Crocodile Hunter and a Greek melody by Georgios Mazanakis Nasha Kasha comes to you from Radio Western 94.9 FM on the campus of Western University in London, Ontario, Canada. We're heard on CHMR 93.5 FM in St. John's, Newfoundland, on CKDU 88.1 FM in Halifax, on Local 107.3 FM in St. John, New Brunswick, on CJAS Radio 93.5 FM in San Agustin, Quebec, on CJLO 1690 AM in Montreal, on CFRC 101.9 FM in Kingston, on CFMU 93.3 FM in Hamilton, on CKMS 102.7 FM in Kitchener, Waterloo, on CJAM 99.1 FM in Windsor and Detroit, on CKLU 96.7 FM in Sudbury, on CILU 102.7 FM in Thunder Bay, on 101.5 UMFM in Winnipeg, on CJTR 91.3 FM in Regina, on CFMQ 98.1 FM in Hudson Bay, Saskatchewan, on C CFBX 92.5 FM in Kamloops, on CJSF 90.1 FM in Vancouver, and on CHLY 101.7 FM in Nanaimo, British Columbia. Asks, who will burn these bridges down? Who will build them back up again? Christina Solovey. For the past 18 minutes, you may have been wondering, married Catholic priests, really? Can this possibly be? Yes. Harken back to 1596 in the union of Brest-Litovsk, a part of the Ukrainian church, which was Orthodox at the time, was accepted under the jurisdiction of the Roman Pope, Clement VIII. As in the Orthodox churches, from which these new Catholics came, marriage would be permitted for Catholic deacons and priests, but only before they were ordained as deacons and priests. In North America, Roman Catholic bishops feared that the presence of these married priests could create a scandal. They tried to stop the practice. But in June of 2014, the Vatican clarified its position and Ukrainian Catholics everywhere are permitted to first marry, 
then to become deacons and priests. There are now cautious discussions with Pope Francis leading the way in special instances to permit Roman Catholic married clergy. The first part of our show was recorded in August of 2018 in London, Ontario. It is now June 29th, 2019. We are at 3625 Cothra Road in Mississauga, St. Mary's Ukrainian Catholic Church, and Michael Hayes, who became Deacon Michael Hayes after our first interview with his wife Alessandra and parents present, was ordained a Catholic priest. Father Roman Galadza has been a priest for 49 years. He and Dobrodika Irena have been married for 50. Back then, they had to move to Canada for him to be ordained. At a reception at St. Elias the Prophet Ukrainian Catholic Church in Brampton, where they serve, in words and in songs, each welcomed the newly ordained Father Michael Hayes and Dobrodika Alessandra Hayes to the challenges and the joys of married clergy life. On behalf of the clergy wives, us women who are married to priests, to welcome <laughs> Alessandra to our circle of clergy. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and to wish you many God's blessings. I, I know that you have been blessed along with your, with your husband, and uh, my wish for you would be for you to you know, um, have, enjoy the opportunities uh, that come to you through this vocation of yours and that there be many more joyful opportunities than there are challenges, okay? <laughs> okay. Um, I, as a lot of you know, I've been studying in a compressed nursing program the past two years, and so I finished that, so I was all focused on that, and now suddenly <laughs> it was time for this. And so I wanted to give a big thank you to Anastasia and Pani Arena for helping plan everything and figure out everything that we needed for today. Today, but most importantly, is a great celebration for the church. The church has a new priest. Gosh, you know, you walked in, just a guy like me, albeit educated in the theology of the church and, and committed to it, and, and you had the rank of subdeacon and then deacon. When did that moment of transfer happen? It happens during the laying on of hands. The deacon is kneeling before the altar, and the bishop has his hand on the deacon's head and he's praying the prayers of ordination is during the is during this time the deacon is becomes a priest there is a a, a joy and peace in my heart right now and and there has been for the whole day do you have a sense that you lose control over your future being a servant of the church or is there an independence in some way that common folk don't understand as a priest certainly i do relinquish a certain amount of control over my life and autonomy, I will now be asked to go different places throughout my life. Unless there's some really good reason, I, I should say yes. The people are not my servant, I am theirs. People know, right? You guys kind of came to this church. I hope you never blame me for this. <laughs> but it kind of came to this Ukrainian Catholic Church of ours, with its, all its weirdness and such, uh, through the fact that you experienced it in this particular community. And so we wish you, uh, 49 years, 50 years from now, what Irene and I have experienced here over our last 50 years. Oh Lord, bless our family. Ready? Give it a try. Oh Lord, bless our family, our loved ones far and near. Loved ones far, the elders, the children, the elders, the children. There are people standing here. Love and laughter, may be love. The hours forever after, forever. Oh Lord, for this we pray. For this we pray. on this blessed day. On this blessed day, may peace, love, may be love and love. The hours
Thank you, man. Are you 25 yet, Alessandra? Um, let's sing this for you, going back with you and your mom and your family. When I was just a little girl, I asked my mother, what will I be? Will I be pretty? Christ is risen. Christos was Christ. I am Father Michael Hayes, and a couple years ago, I was on the Nasha Kasha radio show and podcast. At that time, my wife, Alessandra, and I were living in London, Ontario. She was studying at Western to become a nurse, and I was working, having already finished seminary. First, I was ordained a priest in June of 2019 by Bishop Stephen, and then sent to Kenora, Ontario for my first pastoral assignment. So I'm now the parish priest at St. Nicholas Church in Kenora and Holy Protection of the Mother of God Church in uh, Red Lake, Ontario. Parish life has been good. It's also been challenging. Just six months or so into our time here, COVID hit and everything shut down. And since then, it's been really challenging being able to get to know parishioners, uh, spend time with them. We're really looking forward to the situation to settle down hopefully soon so that we can really start to get to know our people better and grow as a community more than we have been able to in the last year or so. In our private lives, uh, Alessandra is working at the hospital here in Kenora. That's worked out very well for her and for us. Uh, we're also expecting our first child at the end of July or early August of 2021. So there is lots to look forward to. Lots of exciting things are happening. Life is interesting and full of blessings. So thank you all and God bless. What will be, will be. And let's go forward about five years. Maybe less. Maybe more. <laughs> now I have children. <laughs> <laughs> Nashakasha is also a podcast. There's an easy way to access it. Go to nashakasha.libson.com. Nashakasha is one word. Libson is spelled L-I-B-S-Y-N dot com. Nashakasha.libson.com. New Pathway Ukrainian News delivers news and insight every week in English and Ukrainian. Subscribe today at newpathway.ca. Partial funding for Nasha Kasha comes from the Taras Shuchenko Foundation and the Ukrainian Credit Union. I'm your reporter Stefan Andrusyak. Back in a week, God willing. Domili Zustrici, Zatijdin Chasu, Dorohi Sluchachi. Hey, Sera, Sera.